Hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, session, staying one step ahead, prevention and control. We will allow um, uh, people to come in and to have a seat um, because we have a very interesting program which is, uh, contains several um, interdisciplinary talks about diagnostics, control, treatment, and vaccines. So it's a blend of interesting approaches, and I'm quite happy um, that we start with uh, diagnostics. Uh, Dr. Kader will talk um, about development and challenges in developing a sensitive diagnostic test for typhoid fever. Dr. Kadri from the International Center for Diarrheal Disease and Research from Bangladesh. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry that I had to we had to bring you all out of your best today after such a beautiful reception last night. And now I'm going to tackle with my remote. I hope I don't have problems like everybody had yesterday. So I have to point over there. So I'm going to talk about typhoid diagnostics, things that we are doing in Bangladesh in collaboration with other people interested in typhoid globally. And uh, and so just to recapitulate what was spoken about yesterday, Shomi gave a good description of uh, the disease burden due to typhoid. We don't have levels of typhoid disease burden all over Bangladesh. But we do know that uh, from urban slums carried out in, by studies in Bangladesh by Abdullah Brooks that there is a high burden. And for all age groups, it's 3.9 episodes per 1,000 years, although this was done in 2005. Again, Shomi has shown very nicely that in his hospital-based uh, um, uh, evaluation that uh, it's very high in children under five years of age, and the isolation rate was highest in the second year of life, and greater than 70% of isolates were from children nine to 24 months of age, which is very important for vaccine, uh, thoughts on vaccine evaluation. And then other studies carried out by ICD-DRB has also shown that in another urban slum, the, uh, the, the burden is two, two episodes per thousand, and higher in those in less than five and um, less in those uh, over five years of age and adults. But then it's a disease that you see in both adults and children. So I was trying to think about all the things that were taught, ta talked about yesterday. And uh, every time something was being talked about in the epidemiology or vaccine or anything, the problem of uh, detection of uh, salmonella typhi and paratyphi was key to all that. And uh, compared to other enteric diseases, especially diarrheal diseases, typhoid diagnosis is a major problem because you cannot test it in stools and you need to have blood. And then there's a period, a uh, small window for evaluation of uh, typhoid, uh, um, uh, for detection of typhoid uh, bacteria. Um, so bo bone or blood marrow within only f first week of infection, serological assays in the second week, stool antigen in the second week and urine in the fourth week. So, I mean, getting all the samples at the right time for diagnosis is a major problem. So, and it, based on that, this is not that kind of an acute disease that patients come with this kind of a, un, uh, a febrile illness to the uh, facilities as soon as at, at the onset of fever. But they come at least three to seven days after onset of fever. So that makes it more difficult. So what we need is, uh, uh, a test that has a larger window for testing, window period for testing. So the different methods have been used. Uh, blood culture, so much smoking about. And uh, I was just going to talk about this slide where uh, Vital has done a systematic review from IVI showing that blood and bone marrow in 10 studies that he saw that were being carried out and that he reviewed, he and his colleagues, and found that uh, blood was only 60% uh, uh, um, sensitive, while 
blood culture was 96% uh, sensitive. So that even blood, uh, in bone marrow culture is not even 100% sensitive for evaluation. So both methods have to be taken in very carefully. And then Tom in Andy's group has looked at a method for using blood culture for five hours and then a PCR to optimize typhoid fever uh, diagnosis in the challenge model that uh, Andy and his group have in London at Oxford. And so with that, they can identify a few more cases, although, as they say, it is not something that is easily adaptable to uh, developing country, country settings easily. I have to, give, to be given extra time for this remote. <laughs> And then there are the commercially available kits. Some of this was discussed yesterday, the Tubex and Typhidot, which may work very well in a non-endemic setting or in a challenge model, but not so efficiently in settings like ours, where we have pre-existing antibodies to uh, typhoid and paratyphoid and other cross-reacting bacteria that persist for a long time. So then we don't, so for us, these uh, tests have not proven to be very good. And uh, some evaluation in Bangladesh showed that uh, the specificity and sensitivity was lower than blood culture. So, based on all this, we've been thinking at ICDDRB, together with colleagues all over the world, what are the properties and attributes that are suitable test for diagnosis of uh, typhoid? And when I say enteric fever, I mean typhoid and paratyphoid both, because as you see, uh, as you must have heard yesterday, that in Bangladesh, the ratio of typhoid to paratyphoid for clinically diagnosed um, enteric fever is like five, five to one or six to one. So there's a lot of paratyphoid in our settings also. So we, something that can be tested using low volumes of blood, because when you do blood culture, you need three to five ml of blood at least. And then this other additional test we should have only one to two ml blood for use. There should be a broad window of testing, as I mentioned earlier. There should be non-interference by antibiotic prior to use. We know that 20 to 30 percent of our patients come in to the facilities after having taken antibiotics. There should not be an effect on pre-existing antibodies in an endemic setting, as I said, for the um, Typhi dot and Tubex methods. And it also should be relatively rapid to aid in diagnosis of the patients, of the febrile illness, ill patients, so that treatment can be started with the right antibiotic as quickly as possible and not randomly with three different antibiotics that need to be changed before the, clinic, before the uh, microbiological and immunological diagnosis has been completed. And it must be easily adaptable to, um, for patient treatment uh, settings like ours in Asia and Africa. And then we also know that we still don't have a, the right antigen uh, uh, for detection of typhoid fever. We use many different antigens, but we haven't yet found one antigen that would be very specific for diagnosis of uh, enteric fever and typh uh, typhoid or paratyphoid. So what we've done, uh, which many of you have know, know probably by now, that we use don't use serum or plasma for the assay, but have um, you know, worked a lot to use the, um, the, the antibodies that are released after uh, antigen exposure to the gut. So we know when there's typhoid, there's stimulations of, of uh, uh, immunocytes in the gut, and as a result of which uh, the bacteria uh, enter into the um, mucosal system and then uh, stimulate uh, the immune system, the adaptive and the innate immune system, and new plasma cells, are, plasma blasts are um, uh, stimulated and antibodies are released, which are when then traffic into the blood as a result of the common mucosal immune system. And this in other bacteria, in other pathogens, is present transiently in the blood. And so this is used for the antibody secreting cell responses, and we use the secretions of these antibodies for the for diagnosis purposes. So I have had a, I have a diagram over here to show you. We take the blood from a person, do a centri density gradient centrifugation, take away the peripheral blood mononuclear cells, take away the supernatant, and then put it on you know, an ELISA plates where we have a 
specific antigen, which is a membrane protein antigen, it's no secret anymore. And then we do the test, and we called it the TP test, which is a typhoid paratyphoid test. So this is very specific in our settings. And uh, sorry, I missed one slide. And in our settings, and we've uh, evaluated this uh, in 92, we've evaluated in thousands of patients by now. But in this study, we took 92 patients with febrile illness of different parameters. Those that had f <coughs> blood culture positive, those that, that were having fourfold increases in vi uh, vital responses, those that had one is to a uh, vital titer of what, greater than 120, those ha were negative in all these other aspects but were positive in the TP test, and those that had were negative in the TP test, and then also looking at healthy controls. We found that this method can be used in, in, and the healthy controls were also evaluated um, in Bangladesh based on um, people who did not have any prior infection prior to two weeks before giving blood. And we found that what was good about this method was that even at the first time at when the patient was enrolled into the study, that is at day zero, you got a very good um, antibody response. Where do I put this? Anyway, I won't get. And so you can see there are three time points. The white scale is the bar is the one at day zero. Then five days later, like you know, it's three to seven days after infection, a patient comes into, our, into the settings. And then there's another blood collection five days later, that is seven, eight, nine, tw 10 to 12 days later. And then there's another blood collection at um, 10 or 15 days later, that is day 20 of the study. And so we evaluated this and we found that, you know, uh, the method was very good and you could even look at the antibodies at, uh, on, at, at the enrollment and also it's at later time points so that um, it was not, it didn't have a small window of isolation. We looked at this method for two antigens, the membrane protein antigen and uh, which is a sonicated lysate of uh, salmonella uh, vivotive bacteria TY21A or with the whole cell lysate of the bacteria. And we found that uh, the membrane protein antigen, which contains a gamish of many things, especially LPS and many membrane proteins, seems to be the best. So we've been using this for our assays. And we got a sensitivity very good in our settings and specificity also. We, are, we must remember we are always comparing with blood culture, which can be ne negative. So the sense specificity decreases. So we were all, we were always looking for looking for methods for young children, and when we went down to children uh, zero to five years of age, this method was just as good as it was for the older children and the adults. So this showed that you know from we now use only one mL of blood for this acid, and so when we have only three or more, four mL of blood from a child coming into the setting, we can easily give away one mL of blood for this acid, and then. Um, um, Jason Andrews is in the meeting, is here somewhere. So he has been uh, working with us and he has uh, compared the uh, TP test um, with the other methods that we have evaluated, uh, which is the Typhi dot, the Tubex, Vidal, and the Vidal fourfold and culture, and finds that, uh, that the TP test actually scored the highest in specificity and sensitivity. And so this was done by him independently, taking all our um, hard data. And then we've now used uh, this test, especially this is important when we are thinking about evaluation of vaccines in endemic settings. We've used this test in 10 different sites in Bangladesh where blood is collected and brought back to us within 24 hours. And we find that it does work very well when we uh, use it even at 24. Where we, we've also done blood culture and we've done um, but we have a little bit questions about blood culture over a long period of time. Uh, but the TP test works quite well. With, based on that, we now have data from all these sites where we've used. Uh, so this is showing that you, know, you can use it in a developing country setting using only one ml of uh, blood. So we've also, as I said, novel antigens are important using working with Ed Ryan and Rochelle Charles and, and other colleagues uh, over here also the, in the audience. We've been using high 
put techniques like Scott's RNA techniques and DNA techniques and uh, IVAT, all these um, different methods to understand what are the different other, other antigens that we can use. And we see that from the different methods, we have 35 proteins in S type A, 20 proteins in S para type A by immunoproteomic analysis using absorbed sera and mass spectrometry, 57 proteins have been detected. But based on that, at least now we have uh, some antigens that are undergoing uh, evaluation, which is the LPS. By far, LPS is very good. We all know that. Then HLYE, hemolysine, and then YNCE and CDTB and others. And efforts are being carried out to use them as single antigen or combined antigen for diagnostics. And then we've uh, also looked at uh, Ed Ryan, but together with Steve Baker, has used this YNCE um, antigen, which uh, can be used uh, for detecting uh, carriers, uh, responses in carriers, and detecting carriers. And so we are going to use this in the STRATA study, with, which we are part of from ICDDRE with Andy Pollard. So then, after having done all this, we always have this problem that how do we convert the TP test to a lateral flow device platform? Because this is what we want ultimately to happen. And so what we've done is converted this test. Uh, the final ELISA has been converted into a dipstick uh, together with a, a local company. And we find that you know it can be used uh, uh, for, mm, for enteric fever. There is no cross-reaction with tuberculosis, Kalazar, dengue, paratyph uh, uh, dengue, but this dipstick is positive for typhoid and paratyphoid. I didn't mention it before, but TP test means both typhoid and paratyphoid. It's one test for both. And then we have now we took it to the com to the local uh, laboratories in Bangladesh, and we found that you know what we were doing in the ICDRB labs were not reproduce were not being were not possible to in the facilities and so we had to again change our methods we could not do our phi call density gradient centrifugation we started doing our rbc lysis and then we, we did not have all they did not have all the facilities for a co2 incubator so we used an ordinary incubator we used simple tubes instead of cell culture plates and we have modification of the antigen when it was converted into this kind of a and this has been evaluated in four laboratories and is still continuing. We have actually changed the antigen when we moved from, a, from the TP test to a lateral flow device because it didn't work so well. So this is uh, what we've been doing. And uh, I'm at the right stage now to finish. We've got this. The, the TP stage has good specificity and sensitivity. It has been evaluated in different places uh, and uh, in Nepal and Tom has also done it in the challenge model. And um, we, have, uh, we think it can be a useful tool on its own, also for complementing blood culture and QPCR. Actually, we've done a study with Meru Foundation and the Shushu Hospital in Dhaka, where we've compared uh, culture and all these other tests. So new antigens need to be evaluated, like I said, which is a very big need. Large-scale production of the kit uh, is needed. And these methodologies will be useful for evaluating burden of disease as well as for testing effectiveness of TCV, which we hope to be part of uh, in evaluation of the conjugate vaccine in Bangladesh. And so, thanks to everyone. So, um, <laughs> thanks very much, Dr. Kadri. So maybe we'll take the que we will take the questions at the end. And uh, for those uh, of you who came after we had begun, uh, my co-chair, uh, Dr. <coughs> Jan Jacobs, and, and I, Buddha Baznet, would like to welcome you all to this morning session. And uh, without further ado, we can now have Dr. Eric Mintz from the Centers for Disease Control, who has a wealth of experience uh, in uh, preventing and uh, wa waterborne and foodborne uh, diseases, working on these diseases worldwide. Dr. Eric Mintz. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good morning to all of you. It's nice to see such a big crowd here this early. Um, 
and, and I, I, I wouldn't call it a wealth of experience, but I've been working on this stuff for a long time, and it's really remarkable to see how in just the last few years, through the support of the Gates Foundation, through the hard work of all of you and many, many other people, uh, typhoid vaccines have become more effective, more widely available, and uh, more affordable. And, and I think all of us would agree that these vaccines will play a rapidly expanding role in the future prevention and control of typhoid fever. And now all we have to do is go out and convince the rest of the world, um, which I think we can do. But um, the Gates Foundation and, and many of us in the typhoid community recognize that both the traditional and maybe some more innovative non-vaccine measures can be used to optimize and expand the uh, impact of uh, typhoid vaccines to larger populations and also to extend that impact for a longer duration of protection. And Anita Zaidi in her introductory remarks mentioned uh, in the Gates Foundation plan for typhoid the, the, the grander thinking about a concerted effort that engages those in the wash sector, the food production and service sector, the public health and the clinical communities on top of what the vaccines can do to maximize their impact. And, and one of our tasks is to identify and prioritize those non-vaccine measures, what can be done by these various different sectors that, that will complement what the vaccines can accomplish alone. Um, Anita used the term toolkit uh, to represent what these other measures might be and uh, that will complement typhoid vaccination and we'll take a look at what might be the tools in the toolkit a little later in the talk. Um, but before going there, I want to um, point out that there are three, oops, a little lag. Okay, there we are. Uh, three sort of fundamental principles of public health that are needed both for vaccines and for these non-vaccine measures. So any intervention, and pretty much for any disease, uh, needs strong epidemiologic and laboratory surveillance in order to identify those target populations. What are the high-risk populations? Um, Early and accurate diagnosis and appropriate treatment is necessary to prevent secondary morbidity and mortality. So vaccines alone, wash alone, everything we do will probably not eliminate or, or um, typhoid completely. There will probably still be people getting sick and they need to be diagnosed and treated early. And this is generally uh, pretty obvious stuff. And then there's education, information, and communication. So whether it's education about vaccines and the need to get your child vaccinated, or education about uh, wash measures or, or other non-vaccine interventions, all of that has to happen to get the most out of the interventions we're using. Um, and what's interesting about combining vaccines and non-vaccine measures, which is not usually done, you know, we have diseases for which there are vaccines and we vaccinate, measles, polio, and then we have diseases for which there are no vaccines and we do non-vaccine interventions, um, norovirus, et cetera. So we um, now have an opportunity if we combine these two things to do cross messaging. So when you're, um, you know, giving somebody soap and telling them about how to wash their hands or improving their water or their sanitation, you can remind them that typhoid vaccination is really important and if they have a young child or whoever is at risk, they need to go get the vaccine and vice versa. If you're vaccinating somebody with a vaccine against cholera or typhoid or something you get from contaminated water or poor hygiene, um, it's an opportunity to remind them that the vaccine isn't 100% protective. Uh, I think that will be true for quite some time still. Uh, and there are other things they can do to protect their family from that disease as well as other diseases. Okay, so um, I know you've all been wondering about this. Uh, the suspense is over. What are the non-vaccine measures? This is, this is just a proposed list. It's not meant to be complete. And in fact, I'd be very interested in hearing from others, uh, their ideas about what else could be done specifically for typhoid fever prevention and control beyond vaccination. 
So I put sanitation at the top because as John Crump reminded us in his first talk, um, I think he, you said the, the portal of exit is, uh, there's very little doubt about that, right? And so really, if we could uh, just get safe sanitation, if we could make sure that all feces was contained, treated uh, before being in, uh, released into the environment, uh, that would be it for typhoid over a matter of time, the chronic carriers would die out. I don't think that's likely to happen, but it's, it's really an important one, especially for typhoid fever because of the human reservoir. Um, safe water for drinking and for hygiene, safe food production and handling as well, and uh, treatment of chronic carriers. And I'm, I'm going to interrupt this slide. We'll come right back to it. I've grouped those under prevention, but here's um, three, four, five. Okay, let's try again. Up, oh, there it is, and it's going to go. <laughs> there it is again. Um, so here is a historical perspective in the United States uh, at the turn of the 20th century back in the early 1900s. Uh, there was a lot of waterborne typhoid and cities rolled out uh, municipal water supplies that filtered and chlorinated the water as well as waste collection systems that kept the waste out of the water sources. And that red period there uh, drops off dramatically. And, I refer to that as the waterborne period. But typhoid and cholera dropped off uh, even earlier than that. And cholera dropped off and really never stuck around. But typhoid had this long, slow decline over a period of decades. And a lot of that uh, ended as food safety um, regulations were introduced and enacted. Shellfish sanitation, milk pasteurization, and improved farming practices, as well as the identification of carriers and either treating them or preventing them uh, from uh, working as food handlers. So back to the slide. Uh, there are a few other things that I thought of um, for control, and that's more in an epidemic or an outbreak situation. I think it's very important. We've heard some examples uh, earlier uh, yesterday um, to investigate, find the risk factors. It may be water. It may be food. It may be a combination of the two or something else and intervene. And environmental microbiology, I think, is showing more and more promise and, and ability to assist with those investigations. Um, there's a thought that perhaps contact tracing and intervening at the household level might be useful in outbreaks or even in high risk or high endemicity settings. So when there is a typhoid case, the other people in the household may be at risk for typhoid. They may have already had typhoid. We don't know. Um, but it may be possible in some settings to go investigate and even intervene with vaccination, with safe water or something else, and education, um, or perhaps with uh, chemoprophylaxis or, or household treatment. Um, I just toss that out there, and again, I make no uh, claim that this is the list. So here's an um, example of. Uh, the safe water, and I won't show too much more, but at the top we have the long term, the safest water supply, that's a municipal water system in the United States, pipe treated water in the home, it's very centralized, treats large volume of water for a lot of people. And I tried to sort of sort it out into levels, uh, and there's a scale, an imaginary scale between development and emergencies, and in the middle, uh, are safe water systems that serve communities, smaller amounts of water, but can deliver pretty safe water. The water may come from borehole wells um, or from surface water sources, but it's stored in a tank, which makes it easy to chlorinate. In fact, uh, it's become more easy now because they have giant tablets, like the little tablets used at home for point of use treatment, but these are for treating 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 gallons of water, and they get the right level of chlorine, so it's bunkered in those big tanks. It can be delivered to community standpipes or through trucks. It can be delivered to other locations, usually pretty good water. Um, and the emergency setting is where point of use or point of collection chlorination um, is most useful. Uh, and that can be chlorination or there are a lot of other ways to make that water safe. But that's really at the household level, perhaps a small institution, a school, or a hospital or a clinic could use that as well, and they do. Um, 
I won't say much about sanitation, but I, I, I was thinking about it, and, and we really, when we go to the bathroom, you know, we may drive a Volkswagen Beetle, or we may uh, walk to work, you know, but when we, if we, you live in the United States or Europe, and when you go to the bathroom, you are, you know, driving a Rolls Royce, you're wearing a Rolex, you're living like a king and a queen. There's a reason they call that the throne. All you do is you touch that handle, and it's gone. Every, all the nasty stuff is gone. All the stuff that could make your family sick or your neighbors sick or your entire community sick is gone. You don't have, you don't see it. It's invisible. It's just like the vaccine. I go, I get the shot, I see that. I have no idea what my T cells are doing or my antibodies are doing. And, and that's the stuff that makes it work. Um, so WASH is, has a lot in common with vaccines in that regard. The invisible stuff is, is the trick. Um, so. I'd be remiss, we've heard a lot about innovation in vaccines and in um, whole genome sequencing, molecular biology. There is innovation in the WASH sector as well. Uh, last week I was in Kibera, uh, the largest informal settlement, I think, in Africa. Uh, and in Kibera and in many other informal settlements, the municipal government does not provide piped water. And so all the water in Kibera, or the vast majority, comes from hoses like these that are um, really illegal, and I, I hope you can see them in the photo there. They run through sewage, and they run on the ground, and they're tied together with rope and string, and they leak, and stuff comes in, and stuff gets out, and uh, it's pretty nasty, and there's, not surprisingly, a lot of typhoid and a lot of diarrheal disease in Kibera. So here's an NGO. Uh, yes? No? There we go. Um, called Shafco, they started working in Kibera. They dug a very nice borehole well. They're getting groundwater. They're not breaking the law and stealing from the municipal pipes. Um, and they have this big tank where they store that water and they chlorinate it. But Kibera is a very big place, and a lot of people would rather get water closer to home instead of walking up the hill to this big tank. It's really quite quite a lot of people in Kibera, and so. If you can see on that photo, um, whoops, wrong photo. There we go. They're running, uh, there we go. See that? That telephone pole there? That's not a telephone pole, that's a drinking water pole. Um, and that's a wide bore hose. So the same hoses that you saw on the ground that were uh, very non-protective of the water, can be run across aerially like that, and there's a cable holding it up. And it runs down to smaller tanks in different parts of Kibera that are closer to people's homes. So they're serving more people with water of better quality. I thought that was so cool. Um, I just had to share it with you. And uh, here's another um, innovation from the sanitation sector. Yes. Uh, so there's a group also in Kenya, Naivasha, that provides toilets in home, and these are container-based toilets, and they do so for free, but the household agrees to pay a subscription service, small amount of money each month, for a technician to come to the house twice a week and to take away the container and replace it with an empty container, a clean container. Um, they take that container back to their processing plant, and they put all the waste in 50-gallon drums, and they heat it up with solar energy to very hot temperatures, hot enough to get rid of all of the bacteria, the viruses, and even the thermotolerant um, ascaris and other parasites. Uh, so they do that, which means that waste is now safe. It's just as good as the waste that comes out of the great big treatment plant in New York City. Um, it can be handled safely. Uh, so that's what you want. And in addition, these guys are so smart, they uh, take that waste, they dry it out, and then they mix it with charcoal dust, the leftover dust in bags of charcoal or charcoal from agricultural waste that they burn instead of burning trees, and uh, they get these briquettes, and they sell the briquettes. The briquettes actually are about 20% treated waste and 80% charcoal and they burn longer. The feces is a good binder, it turns out. And so restaurants like them because they can cook, uh, they can do their barbecue, 
uh, think about this next time you eat out in Kenya, um, <laughs> on those briquettes. They don't smell bad, everybody wants to know. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, we've been told that they don't taste bad, but I can't vouch for that. That was an N of one. Um, so that's pretty cool. I want to say a little bit about policy and then we'll end. Um, the Millennium Development Goals, many of you know, uh, the water goal was achieved. The proportion of people without improved water sources reduced by half. The sanitation goal was not reached. It was the same goal, but it's about improved water source, in quotes, and improved sanitation, which is not about water quality. Um, so we looked at improved water sources, uh, WHO did, and here you can see that um, different sources on, on the right of the graph um, are better or worse, even though they're called improved. All the blue ones are improved, but the proportion without fecal bacteria of those improved sources goes from about 88 in the piped treated water, so in the hotels here, for example, probably higher than that. Uh, so 88% without fecal indicator bacteria, and for protected dug wells, which are an improved source, only 55% do not have fecal indicator bacteria. And they tested in several countries, Bangladesh, Nepal, Ghana, and Congo, improved water sources. The light bar is the uh, percent that the country reports as improved water sources their population has. The darker bar is the percent of those sources that had no E. coli. So in Nepal, this is the striking example, 91% of the people have improved water. Sounds pretty good. Only 17% of that improved water has no E. coli. Doesn't sound so good. So um, we're lucky because the MDGs are gone, the SDGs are here, and the SDGs about drinking water talk about water quality, safe and affordable drinking water for all. And uh, by safe, they mean free of fecal contamination. So this really could make a difference if this goal, even if it isn't met, if we track this goal, we'll have a much better handle on typhoid. And I'm not going to talk about the sanitation goal except to say that, um, oh dear, <laughs> uh, that there are some new things. There we go. Uh, so instead of just an improved sanitation source, which is basically the toilet, it's the part you see, they're talking about sewage treatment. So it's what's after the toilet that matters. Is that waste successfully treated? Fecal sludge management. Get familiar with that term. It's going to be the next big thing. Uh, so making sure that that waste, before it's released into the environment, is safely treated. Um, and I think that also could make a huge difference in typhoid. There's also a hand washing goal, completely new. There didn't used to be one, and that too should make a big difference. I have a few scenarios, but we're out of time. Keep going? Okay. So, oh, we are out of time. Okay, so we can talk about those during the question session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Eric. Yes, so. We can, we will have questions at the end and then after that there's this coffee break where we can also talk some more. Our next speaker is from the uh, Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine and he is Chris, Dr. Chris Perry. I've known Chris Perry for years and uh, for me, uh, his knowledge base about typhoid fever, uh, at about typhoid enteric fever is nothing short of spectacular, Dr. Chris Perry. Good morning, everyone, and th thank you for that introduction. And thank you also to the Denise and the organizers for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, so I'd like to talk a little bit about treatment. Um, and we'll cover a little bit about trends in antibiotic resistance, the impact of resistance, case finding and treatment as control, antimicrobial combinations and clinical trials. So it's almost 70 years since the publication of this paper in which chloramphenicol was shown to be uh, an effective drug for treating typhoid fever. Um, and for those of us too young to remember that time, I have put this quote um, from a clinician treating patients who said that the clinical improvement and complete transformation in a few days 
can only be appreciated by clinicians who have had previous experience of typhoid fever and have known their own helplessness uh, to affect its protracted course. Its great value in saving life and curtailing morbidity in this disease is incontestable. Um, so it was really a revolutionary uh, uh, introduction at the time. <coughs> for many years, chloramphenicol was the treatment of choice for typhoid fever, but after about uh, uh, 20 years, in the early 70s, chloramphenicol resistance appeared with uh, several large outbreaks. People used cotrimoxazole and ampicillin and amoxicillin, but then in the late 80s, we saw the emergence of multidrug resistant disease, so resistant to all these three drugs, uh, and this was plasmid mediated. Um, ciprofloxin and ofloxacin, keftriaxin and cefixime, uh, took over as the, the mainstays of therapy, and particularly the fluoroquinolones. And in areas where fluoroquinolones were used widely, about two to three years later, we saw the, the emergence of strains with decreased susceptibility to ciprofloxacin, uh, often uh, uh, denote, denoted by the laboratory marker of nalidixic acid resistant. And, and these strains, uh, the resistance is because of a point mutation in the target site. It's important to realize that these strains are not completely resistant to the fluoroquinolone. So uh, patients respond less well. Some patients don't respond, but many patients do respond, but slowly. Um, but treatment of patients with these strains may encourage the emergence of further resistance. Azithromycin and gatifloxacin were added to the armamentarium. Um, but we're now seeing strains that are resistant to gatifloxacin uh, and also completely resistant to ciprofloxacin. And also there are sporadic reports of azithromycin-resistant strains and also cephalosporin-resistant strains. And I particularly worry about keftriaxone resistance, and there's a couple of uh, presentation in poster about keftriaxone-resistant strains from Pakistan and Democratic Republic of Congo that are uh, of concern. Um, MDR rates, as we heard yesterday, have gone up and come down um, in, in different areas. Um, uh, of concern is in some areas, those resistant genes have moved from the plasmid to the chromosome um, and, and so are more fixed in that population. Um, and as, whoops, as we also heard, the H58 clade is responsible for much of the re recent um, epidemics of, uh, of drug-resistant disease. Um, and as we heard yesterday, the, the distribution of resistance is really quite varied in different parts of the world. And I don't really understand all the factors that determine that. But it, it, it varies in different places, and it's changing over time. Uh, and that's important. The, the main trial that's been reported since the last meeting in Bali is this comparison between gatifloxin and keftriaxone conducted in Nepal. Uh, which showed a 26% failure rate in the gatifloxacin arm because of the emergence of resistance uh, in, in Kathmandu. Interestingly, it also showed in that that was in the culture-positive population. In the culture-negative patients in the trial, actually gatifloxacin patients did better than the keftriaxone patients, which may potentially point to other causes of uh, fever in those patients, like rickettsial infection. Oops. Um, if we have resistance to all those other drugs, what are the alternatives? Well, people have, on occasions, used carbapenem, such as intravenous meropenem, imipenem, ertapenem. Uh, there's an oral carbapenem, farapenem perhaps fourth-generation cephalosporins, perhaps IV tigacycline. The thing to note is these drugs are mainly IV uh, and very expensive, and in areas where typhoid is endemic, are probably not available. Um, we may also want to revisit an old drug, oral mycilinan. What's the impact of resistance? I just want to present three studies which try to look at that. This is from Professor Bhutta in Pakistan from the 90s at the height of the MDR outbreak. Uh, and he demonstrated that toxicity uh, was higher in patients, children, uh, 
uh, with MDR infections, and there was a non-significant uh, higher rate of mortality as well. Um, this study from Rajni Gaind and colleagues in India showed that um, patients infected with an analytic acid-resistant strain had a higher rate of complications. Um, and we showed similar data from Vietnam. Patients infected with a, uh, an intermediate ciprofloxacin susceptible strain had a higher, significantly higher rate of severe or fatal disease. It's important to reflect on what we're trying to do when we treat a patient with typhoid. So we're treating an individual patient. We want to cure them, prevent complications, prevent death, and also relapse. Um, we want the treatment to be safe, particularly in children and also adults, affordable, available, with easy adherence. But there's also a public health perspective to treatment. So we're treating the patient, but we're also treating the community. Um, and in particular, we want treatment to prevent acute fecal shedding, convalescent and chronic carriage, uh, because that's the source of transmission to other patients. So if we imagine a patient with fever presenting to a healthcare center or hospital, um, so many will be treated with empiric therapy because diagnostics are not available. Um, um, but where there are diagnostics, there's a process of, of case finding or diagnosis. Uh, and we know from previous talks, blood cultures, usually not available or not used. The VDAL test lacks sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and the commercial diagnostic point of care tests also lack sensitivity and specificity. Um, and, and just to point out, we've been looking that and there will be soon uh, to be published a Cochrane systematic review of these rapid diagnostic tests uh, showing uh, a lack of sensitivity and specificity and diagnostic accuracy. If case finding can occur and there's a diagnosis made then, then one can give specific treatment for typhoid um, and we hope the empiric or specific treatment will lead to a clinical cure. But post-treatment, there's usually some acute fecal shedding. Um, and that acute fecal shedding is a source of transmission for new patients. So we also would like our treatment to truncate that acute fecal shedding. Um, and this is an area that has been little looked at, or looked at in not a great detail in men, many of the clinical trials. So we have a, Clinical trials have given us a good idea of what uh, regimens will lead to a clinical cure, um, but there's been less attention paid to uh, acute fecal shedding, I would suggest. So this is some data from clinical trials from Vietnam uh, looking at short courses of fluoroquinolones for treatment in uncomplicated disease. Um, and in 570 patients treated with uh, uh, ofloxacin with nalidix acid susceptible strains, the pretreatment levels of carriage that we were able to get vary between 14 and 22 percent, depending on the number of samples we could examine. Post treatment, uh, the levels were 2 to 4 percent, so there was a, a significant reduction in carriage rate to low levels. In contrast, in the nalidix acid resistant infected patients, the pretreatment levels were higher at 32 to 38%, and post-treatment, the levels were between 17 and 20%. Um, so in, in patients infect, infected with analytic a, a acid-resistant strains, the levels of acute shedding post-treatment were fivefold higher than those with susceptible strains. And I would suggest that that's a potential factor driving transmission. So if we imagine uh, a population of, of Salmonella typhi in an area, most of, most of the strains are susceptible, but a few strains will be resistant either because of mutation or because of the acquisition of a, of a plasmid. And we give treatment and we get a clinical cure. Um, but if there is this difference in acute fecal, fecal shedding leading to differences in transmission, um, 
the resistant strains are going to be transmitted more than the susceptible strains. And over time, that will lead to uh, an increase in, in resistance in that population. So what sort of regimens do we need um, to try and deal with the problem of acute shedding? Um, I think the first thing we need to do in, in clinical trials is, is to look at this more carefully. Um, but maybe we, we would benefit from using antimicrobial combinations for treatment. In general, people use a single, uh, or recommend using a single drug. So antimicrobial combinations are generally used for initial antimicrobial therapy uh, to broad, broaden coverage against resistant organisms uh, and also to widen the spectrum of organisms covered. Uh, and in this respect, you might imagine that in patients with suspected typhoid, you, you give an antibiotic typh for typhoid, but they may have a rickettsial infection in some areas of the world, so you might want to give an additional drug to cover rickettsia. Um, synergy is often quoted as the reason for combinations, but actually the, 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 the occurrences where that really uh, it, it does occur it, uh, quite few. Um, the third, third reason is to prevent resistance, and the, this is a paradigm that's well accepted in HIV, TB, malaria. There are potential disadvantages to giving combinations, increased adverse reactions, increased cost. Um, one has to think very carefully about the formulation of combinations. Uh, Ideally, you want to have fixed dose combinations so people are not taking two separate drugs, they're taking the two drugs together. Um, my understanding, we mentioned this yesterday, in some parts of India, these fixed dose combinations are already available and being used, but there is no evidence base as to whether they um, are, are effective or if they're the right combinations. Just to briefly mention, there's also uh, laboratory work going on ant antimicrobial combinations with other agents like liposomes, nanoparticles, antimicrobial peptides, uh, which may also uh, be, a, be another route uh, to more successful treatment. Um, so the, 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 there's a small body of work looking in vitro at antimicrobial combinations against Salmonella. Um, we conducted a trial in Vietnam some years ago looking at an ofloxacin azithromycin combination uh, compared with ofloxacin or azithromycin alone. Um, the combination didn't really work better than azithromycin alone, uh, but I think we, we didn't formulate the combination uh, as well as we should have done. There's an intriguing recent report from Israel uh, suggesting that a combination of keftriaxin and azithromycin work better for paratyphoid infection uh, compared with keftriaxone alone. So in conclusion, I would suggest over the last 70 years, there's been a relentless increase in resistance to each successive uh, drug that's been in introduced. MDR has gone up and down, and there, there are many calls for us to go back to the old drugs. Um, chloramphenicol, cotrimoxazole, and moxicillin. Um, and I have, I have sympathy with that, but I do worry if we go back to the old drugs that the plasmids haven't gone away uh, and that resistance may just return again. Resistance has an impact on morbidity and mortality. I, I would like to hypothesize that case finding and treatment is a neglected third method of control in addition to vaccines and WASH but we need more evidence for that. Um, maybe we need antimicrobial combinations and new formulations, but we need randomized controlled trials to provide an evidence base for, um, uh, for sensible prescribing. And just finally to mention, so uh, as you know, WHO has listed Salmonella on its list of AMR organisms of concern. And also WHO and the Drugs for Neglected Tropical Disease Initiative are incubating a new organization, the Global Antibiotic Resistance Development or GARD partnership to develop new drugs for bacterial infections and enteric infections including uh, Salmonella is, is on the, the list of drugs that they're considering. 
So just to conclude, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the, the contributions of discussions with uh, Professor Buddha, Steve Baker, Nick Feasy, Helen Gelband, and Isabel Ribeiro uh, and DNDI. So thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, uh, Dr. Perry. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Christine Mo from Emory University, and she's going to be talking about the SANIPATH approach to fecal exposure assessment and application to typhoid transmission. Her research uh, over the years has focused primarily on environmental transmission of infectious agents. Dr. Mo. Thank you. So I, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Denise and the organizers for inviting me, who is not really a typhoid person, to come and speak at this meeting. Uh, I have worked in the WASH sector for a number of years, and so of course I'm interested in this intersection between WASH and typhoid. So just an overview of my talk, and I'm grateful to Dr. Mintz for helping set up, my, set up my talk. I want to make the point that urban sanitation now is not just about toilets, but we also need to consider where the fecal sludge ends up, which is the term that Dr. Mintz just introduced to you, and convince you that children in many low-income neighborhoods in formal settlements may be living surrounded by shit. And how does that uh, affect their risk for typhoid? I want to talk to you about our SANIPATH approach for assessing exposure to fecal contamination in the environment, and then talk about the potential for adapting this approach to study typhoid transmission, risk of typhoid. So talking about urban sanitation, this is this idea about fecal sludge management that Dr. Mintz introduced. And I know that this is a complicated slide, so I just want to point out a couple things. So at the top of the slide here, you see what's called the sanitation chain that looks at what happens, is the excreta contained? Is there emptying, transport, treatment, and what is the final fate of the excreta? The large red arrows that you see here are showing fecal sludge that is unsafely managed and that ends up back in the environment. The smaller green arrows show fecal sludge that is safely managed. This is done on a citywide basis, and this example that you see is for Dhaka, Bangladesh. So you see that 98% of the fecal sludge ends up in the environment. Ah. Thank you. So what are the public health risks from having this fecal sludge in the residential environment? And what information do governments need to address this risk? So here are a few photos to get you thinking about how people living in urban settings may be exposed to fecal contamination in the environment. There are floodwaters that carry fecal contamination that's in the soil or in the open drains. There are public latrines where people may wipe their hands on the walls after using the public latrine. There are open drains, and here you see in this photo, a child who's gone into an open drain to fetch a toy or something interesting. There are surface waters that receive untreated sewage, untreated fecal sludge, and people have contact with the surface waters. There is fecal contamination of soil, and it could be areas where children are playing. There is wastewater irrigation of produce that we heard about, very common, and we heard about that example yesterday in Chile. There's also potential for fecal contamination of bathing water and fecal contamination of municipal water supplies, as uh, Dr. Mintz just described in Kibera.
So when you have these different pathways, or you can think of them as transmission routes, which of these pathways poses the greatest risk? Because the risk may not be the same. Should we try to intervene to improve the municipal drinking water? Or should we focus on foodborne transmission? Or perhaps there's a greater risk from flooding. So this poses a dilemma when we think about water and sanitation interventions. Where do we invest our money to have the most impact? And this uh, SaniPath exposure assessment approach is designed to assess public health risks related to poor sanitation and help prioritize investments, help prioritize interventions so that they focus on the pathways or the transmission routes that pose the greatest risk. So thinking about risk of exposure to fecal contamination in the environment, we realize that it's a combination of two factors. Where is the fecal contamination in the environment? What is the magnitude of that contamination? And what is people's behavior that brings them into contact, that uh, exposes them to this fecal contamination? So in the data that we collect, we focus on behavioral data, asking people about frequency of different um, practices, frequency of exposure, and we collect environmental samples from relevant pathways or parts of the environment, and we test those samples for E. coli as a marker for fecal contamination. This um, SaniPath tool, we use mobile data collection. The data is stored on the cloud, and all of the analysis is done on the cloud. So it's a very easy to use um, system after you have uh, collected the data. And then we use Bayesian methods to put all of this data together to estimate risk. So you see that the behavior data is shown as a pie chart. And this is looking at frequencies of behavior. So in this example here, this is frequency of eating uncooked produce, raw produce. And this is expressed as number of times per week. On the right-hand side, these are the data from environmental contamination. So this is showing the results of produce samples from a particular neighborhood. And E. coli concentration is on the x-axis and the y-axis is simply number of samples. So it gives you some idea of the magnitude of contamination of the produce samples. And then using information from the literature on intake volumes, on um, um, duration of exposure, we put this data together to make what we call a risk profile or a people plot. And this is the idea of communicating risk to non-scientists using an easy graphic. So I just want to orient you to these people plots a little bit more. These are some examples looking at uh, drinking municipal water. And here you see the proportion of red people to green people. That shows the proportion of people who report exposure. And the uh, shade of red shows the magnitude of a contamination. So the light pink here means that the municipal water was less contaminated. The dark red shows that the municipal water was more contaminated. So just an easy way of communicating risk. We have used this approach in 17 different neighborhoods to date in Accra, Ghana, in Velour, India, Maputo, Mozambique, um, Siem Reap, Cambodia. We're also doing this in Atlanta because many people ask us, well, if you did this in a neighborhood in an industrialized country, what type of uh, risk would you see? So we're also doing this in Atlanta, and currently our research team is in Dhaka, uh, deploying this uh, tool in 10 neighborhoods in Dhaka, in collaboration with ICDDRB. 
We also have plans to do this in Dakar, Senegal, and we're looking at additional cities. This approach is focused on urban um, sites because as Dr. Kariyuki said yesterday, this, uh, these informal settlements in urban areas, they can be a hot spot for exposure and transmission of enteric diseases. So what, what are the information needs for advocacy and investment decisions to control enteric diseases, including typhoid fever? So we want to know what is the frequency and the magnitude of exposure to fecal contamination in the urban environment, and which of these exposure pathways pose the greatest risk. How do these fecal exposure pathways vary in a single neighborhood? Or how do these fecal exposure pathways uh, vary in multiple neighborhoods in the same city? And how do these pathways vary as you start comparing city to city? So I want to show you some of the results of the deployments in the cities that I've just mentioned. So these are showing results from a neighborhood in Accra, Ghana. This was done last year. And you see four different pathways open open drains, produce, municipal tap water, and public latrines. This is a single neighborhood, and right away you can see that the, a lot of people, for example, are using public latrines, but their exposure to fecal contamination in the public latrines is to a relatively small dose from, from touching surfaces. But you see that a lot of people are eating uncooked produce, and that the uncooked produce is highly contaminated in this neighborhood in Accra. So what happens if we look at multiple neighborhoods in Accra? So here is data now on five neighborhoods in Accra. I want to point out that one of these neighborhoods, Ringway neighborhood, was a higher um, social economic uh, status neighborhood. And this is showing the results from these five neighborhoods. So the neighborhoods are in columns here. And you see four different pathways. And so as you look at these results, you will see right away that produce was a high risk exposure pathway in all five neighborhoods. So you see a dark red color, and you see a high proportion of people that are reporting that they eat uncooked produce on a frequent basis. And even if you look at this uh, wealthier neighborhood of Ringway, you see that they may have somewhat less exposure than some of the other neighborhoods, but their exposure to contaminated produce is just as high as the poor neighborhoods. So here, this is similar in some ways to what we heard the story in Chile, that you have um, good uh, access to improved water sources, you have sewage treatment, but you still have exposure through uncooked produce that's been irrigated with wastewater and has fecal contamination. So how can we use this approach to assess uh, risks of environmental transmission of typhoid? So we are fortunate to have just uh, received an award from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I just want to briefly mention the types of things that we're going to be looking at in this uh, project. So we're looking at what are the vehicles and pathways that transmit salmonella typhi or paratyphi A in outbreaks and endemic areas. What do we know about these organisms in the environment? Where do they hide out? How long do they per persist? Can we develop good methods to detect them in the environment? And what do we know about the exposure behavior of the age groups that have high incidence of typhoid? 
And as we heard yesterday, these are different age groups. It could be the under fives, it could be school age children, it could be adolescents. So we need to understand the difference behavior in all of these groups. We also want to look at can we trace uh, human fecal contamination in various environmental samples. So currently we measure E. coli, but we know that E. coli is an indicator of both human and animal fecal contamination. We've been working with the University of Brighton on phage-based methods that are more specific for human fecal contamination, and we are working to test protocols to develop salmonella typhi and paratyphi in environmental samples. And again, thanks to the Gates Foundation, now there are multiple investigators that are collaborating and sharing protocols on methods to detect these organisms in the environment. And if you are interested in this, please come and talk to me because we would love to have you join our group. Um, the next part of our study will be uh, using this Sanipath typhoid approach in two cities in India. We're going to be collecting more detailed information on behavior. And I just want to show you this picture that, uh, that our field team sent from Dhaka just a couple days ago. These are little boys in uh, Dhaka, and you can see that they are happily swimming in a sewage lagoon. So. Boys will be boys anywhere in the world. And this is, um, you know, there could be exposure through street food consumption, but there could be exposure through surface water contact. So we want to make sure that we look at all of these potential transmission routes, collect environmental samples, test them for multiple markers of fecal contamination, as well as uh, Salmonella typhi and Paratyphi A and then use our Bayesian modeling approach to develop risk profiles for these uh, different transmission pathways. Ah, there it goes. And then the last part of our uh, study is to develop an environmental surveillance strategy for Salmonella typhi and Paratyphi A, as Professor Buta, Buto was um, uh, suggesting yesterday. We can use this to determine, is there typhoid in the city? Where is the typhoid found? How much typhoid is there? And does it give us some information about incidence or prevalence? And here I'm showing a, a map of one of our study sites in Accra, Ghana, where we have mapped out our detection of adenovirus, which could be a marker of human fecal contamination, as well as E. coli in the open drain. So we could take the same approach for Salmonella typhi and Salmonella paratyphi A. So I just want to close by acknowledging that there are many people on our team and we have worked with terrific collaborators in many uh, cities in the world. So um, it has been a team effort and we are very grateful for the support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that has made this work possible. And we have a website, sanipath.org, so if you're interested in this approach, we would be happy to talk with you and share our tools with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Uh, so we'll have questions at the end. <clears throat> Our next speaker, uh, Dr. Myron Levine, hardly needs any introduction from the University of Maryland. And uh, he's going to be talking to us about a broad spectrum vaccine to prevent invasive salmonella disease in sub-Saharan Africa. Good morning, everyone. Um, we're way late. Uh, I'll speak as fast as I can and try to cover uh, the topic. In the audience today, we have uh, uh, Rafi Simon, uh, the key uh, scientist involved with the conjugate vaccine approach. We have um, Ellen Higginson and Scott uh, Balaban, and we have Krishna uh, Mohan. I think I pressed. Whoop. Oh dear, this is tricky. I thought it'd be helpful if we all together 
uh, talk about the clinical syndromes that the different serovars of uh, typhi of, sorry, salmonella cause. There we go. Three broad clinical pathological epidemiologic uh, entities, enteric fevers, mainly caused by salmonella typhi, but also by paratyphi A and B, and rarely by C. Invasive non-typhoidal salmonella disease, which we see clinically in sub-Saharan Africa as septicemia, bacteremia, meningitis, septic arthritis, and in uh, special hosts, even in the industrialized world, see the same. The main organisms are Salmonella typhimurium and Duridatus, and what one can call a monophasic variant of typhimurium. It looks and smells and acts like typhimurium, but it doesn't make the phase two flagella. And then just to mention, in some parts of the world, there are focal metastatic infections caused by Salmonella cholera suis or Paratyphi C in local ecological sites like the island uh, country of Taiwan, where uh, cholera suis was a big problem. We have heard and we know that across the globe there is variation in what syndromes are seen and therefore the causative organisms. So in Asia, in terms of a vaccine, we need a vaccine that will prevent typhi and paratyphi, but we don't see a need for the invasive non-typhoidal salmonella. In contrast, as we've heard the past days, invasive non-typhoidal salmonella is an enormous problem in infants and toddlers in sub-Saharan Africa, where in many areas there is also typhi, and so we need a vaccine that will cover three pathogens, three serovars for Africa. And if we were back in the 70s uh, in uh, Latin America and South America, we would need typhi and paratyphi B, which was the main number two pathogen at that time in that part of the world. This is a, a slide that uh, shows uh, a paper from a clinical study, a health facility based that uh, was carried out by a group in Rwanda. They had an excellent clinical microbiology laboratory at the Centre Hospitalier de Kigali. And uh, 900 uh, consecutive uh, uh, kids that came uh, to the health center they drew blood culture. What one sees is that in the first two years of life, there's much more non-typhoidal salmonella, but there was also salmonella typhi. When you get up to four years of age and above, one sees that it switches and typhi becomes the major uh, uh, pathogen. And a point that hasn't been made up to now, but I think should be, is that if you look at the clinical syndrome, and if we're asking about typhi, um, sorry, <laughs> one sees that in infancy, perhaps one in a hundred kids with the same clinical syndrome will have typhi. And if you had a vaccine that was 100% effective in that place, uh, you would prevent around 1% of that clinical syndrome may still be important epidemiologically, but you wouldn't see an impact. If you go to the older age group of five uh, years or six years of age, one in five individuals presenting with fever to that clinical facility grew uh, typhi in their, their blood. The other point, important point to be made is that early on these folks showed there was this difference in case fatality. And Typhi had a bad case fatality in that, that poor uh, area, 4%, but it paled compared to the case fatality seen with the invasive non-typhoidal salmonella. Around 2000, a number of uh, research centers in Africa 
began to do systematic blood culture surveillance looking to measure the burden of Haemophilus influenzae type B and of invasive pneumococcal disease. And as they did that, serendipitously, they found lots of invasive non-typhoidal salmonella. I put here three of the classic studies that are population-based. We have incidence rates. We have a comparison to invasive pneumococcal disease. I apologize for this moving around. Those of you who know me, I am colorblind, and I don't know if I even have, I thought this was a good one, but I can't see it, so let's wing it. Anyway, <laughs> what you can see is that uh, the disease starts early. It has incidence rates that are very high, as high as invasive pneumococcal disease, which globally all public health agencies were so worried about. And we saw this disease in the Gambia with a very low HIV prevalence, even as we saw it in places like Manisa, which had very high prevalence. Let me zero in now on a place where we set up surveillance that began in 2002. On this picture, you see uh, the Director General of CVD Mali, Samba So, you see Karen Kotloff, and ev just about every child with fever or with a clinical syndrome that was suspect of invasive bacterial disease had a blood culture or spinal fluid culture upon entry to hospital in uh, Bamako. And what we found amongst the invasive disease cases is that four pathogens account for almost 90% of the disease. Enteritidis, typhimurium, the monophasic variants of typhimurium, and Dublin, which is a group D, like enteritidis and typhi, and shares a uh, uh, one uh, phase one flagella antigen with uh, enteritidis. So if we had a vaccine against enteritidis and typhimurium, we should be able to uh, cover uh, almost 90% of those organisms. What age group do we need this vaccine for? If you look on this slide, you'll see that uh, almost all the disease is in the first five years of life of this severe disease. If you look in the first five years, it's mostly in the first three years and a big, big chunk in the first two years. So we have to get vaccine in early. And if you look in the first year of life, you see a relative sparing in the first semester, which uh, allows us to, to immunize, but there's still plenty of disease even in the first year of life. And in the second half of the first year of life, we're up at a, a peak incidence. This is a bad disease. The uh, uh, typhimurium and the enteritidis were antibiotic, multi-resistant, and had high case fatalities, with enteritidis being significantly higher than typhimurium. But Dublin was completely antibiotic sensitive, and still there was a 15% case fatality for Dublin. What this says is, these are bad organisms in these hosts in sub-Saharan uh, Africa. I am pressing, but nothing is happening. Oh, there. We initially thought that most of the mortality would be in the first year of life. But as you see here, both for typhimurium and enteritidis, in each year of life, in the first uh, uh, five years of life, there is a high case fatality. These are the bugs, this is not the host, even in two and three and four year olds. And consistently, in Mali, in each one of these age groups in a low HIV prevalence area, enteritidis is a higher case fatality than uh, typhimurium. And it's this, this case fatality that has driven our interest in non-typhoidal salmonella from the beginning. In Bambara, Mali means hippopotamus. And all of this severe disease and mortality that we see in the hospital is just the eyes and the ears of the hippopotamus. There's a huge burden out there of kids who never make it to healthcare who surely are dying of this 
uh, disease. Yet, in a place like Mali, in Bamako in particular, there's an excellent expanded program on immunization with great uh, coverage. We have, uh, over the years now, developed a vaccine against invasive non-typhoidal salmonella, and by combining that with an existing, very good VI conjugate vaccine, we end up with a trivalent vaccine. Later today, you'll hear from Rafi Simon in great detail about the conjugate vaccines. Very briefly, um, the key to our conjugate vaccines, or one of the keys, is that we engineer the strains of Typhimurium and Enteritidis so that one can have a very economical vaccine. The carrier proteins that we use are flagellant subunits. The uh, main uh, haptin of interest is the core plus O polysaccharide that Rafi will tell you about and how they're conjugated. And we can engineer the strains so they hyper express flagella and spit out the flagella as subunits rather than as whole flagella that have to be broken apart. And all of this enhances the uh, uh, economy. We also have a live oral vaccine approach because the so-called reagent strains that we use to make uh, antigen for the conjugates with a little tweaking are potential uh, very good live oral vaccines. But we will talk just about the conjugates because that's the one that's moving ahead. We have to take some gambles. We're, we're aiming to produce serum antibodies this includes binding antibodies against both the O polysaccharide and the flagella, and we have evidence that even antibodies against the flagella do have protective activity, even administered uh, passively in an animal, animal model. And we can show functional activity, including opsonophagocytic and serum bactericidal antibody, if typhimurium and enteritidis, if act like a meningococcus, then serum bactericidal activity in correlation with our vaccine should give us a very good vaccine. I am pressing this button, but there we go. So I want to tell you now about a modeling to look at what a vaccine uh, might, might do if it had good efficacy similar to Hib conjugate vaccine given with the coverage that we achieve in Mali. This is a recent paper produced by a PhD student of mine, Chrissy Bornstein, with modelers Laura Hungerford, David Hartley, and John Sorkin. And all I did was ask them to substitute what an NTS vaccine would look like if it acted. Come on, machine. There we go. Um, so quickly, this is what uh, a HIB looked like in Mali. Very similar epidemiology to invasive non-typhoidal salmonella. Relative sparing in the first few months of life. Uh, great increase as maternal antibodies disappear up to almost 400 cases per 100,000 at six to month, uh, seven months of age. Introduction of HIB after three years of surveillance on the far left. I think that's brown or whatever it is. <laughs> Introduction of vaccine in July of uh, 2005, and then in six month intervals, you see the die off of uh, the burden of disease to the point where it's a, essentially a 90% reduction. If we look at what's happening in the blood of kids, in a baseline survey before the first vaccine dose was given, um, less than a half percent of kids had titers of anti-HIB antibody. 18 months after the first dose in a survey, it's about 70% of kids have a high titer of one microgram per mil, which gives long-term protection against HIB. And at 30 months after the first dose, it's up to um, uh, 80%. This is what would happen with invasive non-typhoidal seminola uh, vaccine in a cohort of kids in the top panel showing if you followed those kids, this is the disease they get. 
in the middle, it's if you had a vaccine that was completely protective and everybody got it. You see the only ones who get disease are early kids who have not yet received vaccine. And then on the bottom panel is real life Hib, a 95% efficacious, 90% uh, coverage vaccine. Uh, the problem we face now is figuring out how to give a couple of doses uh, uh, to kids to get both anti-typhoid and anti-invasive uh, non-typhoidal salmonella uh, coverage. The uh, sub-Saharan Africa EPI schedule now is very crowded both in the first year and even in the recently introduced second year uh, of life. And we will be doing clinical trials in both of those uh, age groups. So for Africa, we need a three serovar vaccine. If we combine the, if we put a paratyphy into that trivalent vaccine, we would have a vaccine for the developing world. If we added protection against group C, we would have a vaccine for the whole world, pretty much, including industrialized countries against invasive disease. Uh, a conjugate vaccine would probably ha have, we're guessing, little impact against gastroenteritis, but an oral vaccine that gave that kind of coverage could even have an impact in, in the industrialized world. Finish up with uh, uh, the folks. Uh, every Friday morning at 5 a.m., Rafi Simon is on the phone with our colleagues in Barat, and he and the Barat team work to get these non typhoidal salmonella uh, moving. The other key players are there, Sharon doing the engineering of the attenuated strains. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. I think in the interests of time, we can allow only two questions. So one from, from the front area and one from the back. Uh, so I'm sorry, I, I think uh, we've run out of question time. Is that okay? Please. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for the great session. A question for Christine um, about Sanipath. Uh, we've heard at this meeting of um, situations of typhoid um, at high levels in rural areas, including in Tanzania yesterday and in Fiji. And I just wondered if you could comment on Sani Path work in rural areas. Um, I, I think our minds are being stretched that um, typhoid may, may not be as urban as we, we've traditionally thought. Question, John. Um, we have Sandy Path is based on a two-year study in urban Accra. So we had that in-depth study that we used to develop the methods, and we know that the methods have been validated. We would like to extend those same principles to rural areas. I think that's an important need, but we feel that we would need to do adequate background work first in order to validate that what we're seeing makes sense in rural areas. So. Um, we hope that we will be able to do that in the future. Thanks for raising that. Thank you. Hi. Um, Aaron Jenkins, Edith Cowan University and University of Sydney, working in Fiji. I'm a wetland ecologist, so my perspective is a little bit different to most of you here. Um, and I have two kind of primary comments, and I think this is the right session to make these comments. So taking Myron Levine's uh, analogy yesterday of the elephant, and I really like that, um, with typhoid as an elephant, where we're hearing of studies about the tusks and the ears and the eyes. But the elephant is in a room within a house, within a neighborhood, which sits in a river basin and a region. And my point is that there's very little investigation of the socio-ecological determinants of this disease in endemic non-outbreak scenarios at these different scales. So to fully understand the drivers of the disease and to accurately predict and intervene, 
effectively, there needs to be simultaneous study of the elephant, the room, the house, the neighborhood, the river, and the region. Which, for the most part, means getting beyond the clinical or lab setting and into the environment where the pathogen was encountered. So we need much more of this kind of nested ecological approaches to understanding typhoid as well as vaccines. And my second point is kind of deliberately controversial. It, it was encouraging to hear a few of these presentations yesterday and today use the words environmental reservoir because at the last conference I was the only one and this is, I feel, there is, I feel, an anthropocentric, anthropocentric assumption that humans are the only reservoir of typhoid. While it's clear that our contemporary models of transmission lack this crucial understanding of the persistence and fate of typhoid in the environment. Very early research showed that S. typhi to be viable in certain nutrient rich media and um, certain saprophytes for almost a year. Uh, recovery from clay loam soils has been reported up to five and a half months and in the presence of certain protozoa, S. typhi survival in the environment increases threefold. So progress on this has been hampered by uh, a lack of the ability to, a difficulty in, cap in culturing from environmental samples. But our recent advances in, in molecular microbiology should allow the study of potentially viable environmental reservoirs. So my question slash comment is, how long must S. typhi persist in the environment to be considered a reservoir of disease? So from an ecosystem perspective, uh, certainly in really high incidence settings and um, endemic settings, we shouldn't discount the environment as a potential reservoir. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Who, who wants to answer this, Dr. Levine? <laughs> I think, I think, is that working? Yeah, I, I think you make some great points in, in, in your comment. Part of it is, uh, is terminology. Uh, I think it was a woman uh, who pointed out that in areas uh, in, in the USA and uh, southern Canada, which uh, have very striking seasons, very cold winters, very warm uh, uh, summers, where typhoid was a, uh, a warm season uh, disease circa 1900, um, but the, the whole environment becomes frozen solid in winter, uh, there would be uh, very few cases during the winter. And then with the coming of thaw, somehow the typhi managed to winter over um, in, in those areas. Now, in that sense, I think your point is taken, uh, that's kind of a reservoir um, even if all the humans uh, disappeared who had typhi and you had susceptibles, they, there would be people at risk. But uh, when the melt occurs, it's still, to me, a vehicle. Um, but, but your point is well taken about the, uh, uh, the concept. I think the general experience in the industrialized world is that when you interfere with amplified transmission, you're left with uh, a much uh, more short cycle transmission, and then you're looking essentially at the die-off of chronic carriers over time, which is a generation or two, and uh, changes in food safety. But eventually, typhi does disappear uh, from, from the environment. So, <clears throat> thank you very much, Dr. Levine. My co-chair, uh, Dr. Jan Jacobs, and I would like to thank all the speakers and for the audience for participating so actively. I'm very sorry that we have to cut short this in the interest of time. Now, uh, at the, uh, please proceed upstairs for poster presentations and coffee and tea, and please be back here at 10.35. Thank you so much. <laughs>